Okay, hello everybody. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, and so yeah, uh, yeah, I'm live James. Uh, there was some issues uh, with James and he couldn't show up. So I'm going to take over for him. My name is Radoslav Stankov and I want to welcome you everybody to uh, Dev Days uh, 21. Uh, here is some instructions uh, for you to have optimal experience. Uh, you can see all the live sessions here. Uh, you can check the schedule. There is in, in the platform, you can see all the speakers. You can get to know the other attendees and you can meet all the companies who, of, who make this uh, event possible. And speaking to uh, sponsors, uh, let me present you our golden sp uh, sponsor, Allegro, uh, it is the most popular shopping platform in Poland and one of the largest e-commerce platforms in Europe. Each month, 20 million customers visit their platform, which is equivalent to 80% of all internet users in Poland. Uh, Poles are more likely to start their product search on Allegro than in, other, in any other search engine. Gene, uh, the, serve, the silver sponsor is Neoflex. Uh, which creates IT platform for digital business uh, business transformations, which help their customers to gain sustainable competitive advantage in the digital era. They focus on custom software development and implementation of complex information system using cutting edge technologies and modern methodologies. And last but not least, our bronze sponsors, it's Metasite, uh, which does bespoke digital financial platform and application design, engineering, integration, and support for financial industry leaders and raising vintage across Europe. Uh, they are technology professionals who believe the power of dynamic flat hierarchy culture, constantly explore IT trends and tools to in and enjoy working in autonomous teams. Uh, the other are Tesla Voltas, uh, Tesla Softas, sorry. Uh, it is a consulting and product engineering company with unique company culture. They help businesses build their full product from start to finish, including, but not limited to the UX and UI, front-end development, back-end development, enterprise mobile and web application development, and Voltas IT, a fast-growing in innovative tech, tech company on a mission to create um, vehicle assistant for digital drivers and it strives to become the global leader in intelligent automotive diagnostics engineers and programmers together develop a professional diagnostic tools ob that helps daily drivers understand and customize their vehicles in the mobile application uh as i mentioned uh, i'm not uh, james i'm radoslav and i'm going to talk about react component anti-patterns uh so yeah hello uh, i'm radoslav uh you can call me rado you can find me on the internet as our stankov i'm based in uh, sofia bulgaria uh Rhea, and currently i'm the head of engineering at product hunt uh I'm going to, sh in my presentation, I'm going to show a lot of code because it's very hard to understand anti-patterns if you don't see them, how they are used. So my slides are already uploaded in uh, my appearances page where I, I upload all my talks and talks. So I have a plan for today uh, and today already starts a bit more weirder than expected, but let's go to have like an interesting battle plan. So for today, I'm going to give you a brief history lesson of my history with React and React in general. I'm going to share with you what I think is a good React component nowadays. And then I'm going to just go to a big list of things which I consider to be a React anti-patterns. Uh, basically, this is Rado approves the definite guide for React, short version. Uh, let's start with the history lesson. Uh, and my history with React, it's, um, for me, history is very important because it gives you context and show us what happens with 
the history of the technologies we use, a lot of people actually say, yeah, everything in technology is changing rapidly. There is always something new. And I'm not very sure about that. I, there are big technology shifts. There are big technology trends, but they don't come that often. They usually come every two, three, four years. So my history with React, um, in 2014, when I joined Product Hunt, the code base there was just a jQuery spaghetti, just sprinkle around. Um, the thing which I introduced back then was Backbone, if you guys remember. Uh, it was a nice, uh, I, I'm a really big fan of Backbone. I think it was the first framework that added the term component and made people to think more around components. Um, in 2014, in February, we introduced uh, React on Rails. Um, and then we uh, used something called Flux, which came from Facebook. And this was a way to manage the state in, Rea in React applications. Uh, by December 2015 already, there was Redux coming into the scene, which totally replaced Flux in the mindset. Uh, in January in 2016, uh, Product Hunt became a single page application. Before then, we just used React components here and there, here and there, with some Redux stores. But then we switched to React Router and become a full page app. In, 2000, in April 2016, we our Redux started to become a bit messy. So we started organizing it with something called Redux Dux, which was just a way to organize uh, reducers, selectors, and all the stuff in the Redux. In the 2017, we totally split out the code for the front-end app from the Rails app. In 2017, February, we introduced GraphQL, which was which slowly started re, uh, moving all the logic we had from Redux back to, to the backend via GraphQL. In 2017, we started having introduce code splitting in our application because back then the core application was one just, just big file. In December, in December in 2018, React introduced hooks. So we started working with hooks. In April 2019, uh, we started using Next.js for another project and switched the whole product later this year into Next.js. And let's compare this to the React history because we went to a lot of shifts. Uh, so when React started, it started with class components. Everything was just a class component. Then the CSS modules come into the scene as a way to style things and have like a separate CSS for a component. The concept of styled components come in at this time and the library with the same name also appeared. Uh, slowly, React introduced functional components, which uh, were components without a state. They were just plain functions, and they reduced their API service quite a bit. Then uh, the concept of high order components appear, and those were components that just wrap another component. And one of the most use cases for high order components was Redux. And another concept which appeared in React world was the renderless components. Those are components which don't, don't render anything, but what they do was they actually do some functionality. Like for example, you have a component which triggers a function on window resize. This component doesn't render anything, but you use that. Then another pattern appear, and this pattern was children as function. Uh, this was a pattern where you pass the function as the child of the React component. And this uh, started to give uh, to replace some of the uses for high order components because high order components were cool, but they introduced a very interesting level of direction and uh, they were very complex to be written. Then the GraphQL appeared into the scene uh, as a way to manage, uh, to, get, to fetch data from the server. And for me personally, GraphQL and Apollo, the library which I use for GraphQL for most of my projects, totally replaced the need for something like Redux. And finally, like the biggest shift which came to the React world was the hooks. And the idea of the hooks was that they were a great replacement for 
high order components. They were a great replacement for class components and they allow us to have a, a functional components and have reusable states. Um, there were a lot of other things coming to the React world. There was something called mixins with the class components, which were deprecated and removed ages ago. Uh, currently in the React world, there is the suspense uh, planning. There is um, there is uh, another interesting concept of server-side rendering. I haven't included them here because they're still not very widely used. But if you see, there is a lot of changes here. There is a lot of things that happen in the React world since 2014. Uh, and those changes were all small incremental changes. They were not, not all of them were like this big paradigm shift. And because a lot of those changes happened, uh, patterns that were very good patterns years ago are now becoming an anti-pattern in my mind. Uh, so... Uh, for me, what a good React component right now and what's in this moment is very different than what's a good component two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. That is totally different right now. And But what's not changed in what's a good component is uh, what's the, the properties of the good components. So for me, uh, when I open a component and this concept of what's a good component the good component right now looks different but for me solves those same answers the same questions in the same way like for example when i open a component i the first thing i want to see from this component is what are the property this component needs to function then i want to actually know what this component does uh, then I want I, I care about things like the component state and the component logic if I need to change the component. Uh, the other thing I care much about is how can I trace logic trace logic across my application and actually understand is this component isolated? It, does it care about the bigger picture? And finally, last but not least, how easy it is to refactor this component? How easy it is to get this component and split it into two or maybe inline this component because it's not needed as a separate component anymore. Uh, bas basically, it is, is this component easy to understand? Is it easy to understand what this component does? So for me, uh, the patterns that emerged uh, the answers of those questions are what's the important stuff. And for and every time React changes, I reevaluate how I write components in order to fit into this mindset. Uh, for me, most components I write are component as folders. They live like in the components folders way uh, in the, in the components folder. The component name is something descriptive, and what the component expose is its index.js file. And I, I structure my components always the same way, and they always follow the, the, this list of things. Like all, every component starts with the imports because that's the JavaScript syntax. The second thing is the types of the component, its prop types. Then I add any constants that are important for the reader to know. And then I have a default export of the main component. And after that, after this default export, I list everything which is not essential for you to know about this component, like any subcomponents, hooks, utility functions, and other things. So here is how it looks like in practice. I start with the imports, then I have the, the component props. I always name them I props. So I know that, okay, those are the props of every component file I open. Then optionally, uh, there are some constants and those constants are stuff that's important to know. Uh, like for example, if the component only accepts a certain props, which are one of those constants, those are important to be known. Then it's the main component. The, the main component here is always the default, always is the name. I and its structure always is kind of the same. I always start with the hooks because 
hooks are important to be on the top of your component because there's rules that component that hooks cannot be conditionally rendered. Then I list my guard clauses, my checks, and then I always end with the happy part of the component to be the last. Uh, so if the reader of the component reads the component, they can see, okay, this is edge case, edge case, edge case, edge case, the bottom of the component is the main happy part. And then in the component file, I list everything else, which is a helper. And a lot of the helpers, oh, if the component is small and it has like one or two helpers, I usually leave them in the same file. If not, I just use the component as folder. So I have like a private components and utilities, the tests of the utilities, the CSS modules. Uh, if the component is connected with the GraphQL, it can have the fragment, the mutation and all of that. And I treat this component as a package and as a black box. And this component is uh, uh, the way users access this component is only to its index file and its default exports. Sometimes some component exports some other helpers when needed. That's very rare. And that's a good component for me. And given this, and given that I think this is a good component, uh, let's go to the meat of the um, talk, which is the anti-patterns that emerged. So what's an anti-pattern? So anti-patterns are certain patterns in software development that are considered bad programming practices. Uh, they are things that are done by people and they're not a good, very good practice. Sometimes this makes sense, of course, like with everything, there's trade-offs, but sometimes they're not. The way I think about it is uh, anti-patterns is called that makes me look like that when I see it or make me look like angry like this or even more angry like that when I see something in the code. And why are the reasons for anti-patterns? Why do they appear? Why do we have them? Um, the first reason in React anti-patterns in particular is that React in its ecosystem evolved. A lot of things which were considered best practices become anti-patterns. One good example of this is the mixins which we had in the class components very early on. They were not the only a bad anti-pattern, they were actually removed from React because they caused a lot of issues. Also, there were a lot of transitions where from normal JavaScript, then having some types or manner checks with flow type and then having TypeScript, like TypeScript removed a lot of the needs of some of the defensive programming stuff. Uh, also, a lot of anti-patterns emerge because, I mean, we have inconsistent UI and designs. Even though we have a UI design system, there is inconsistencies in the UI. And a lot of people, when they see a design they cannot implement with the current component set, they just, okay, I'll just add this property here. I'll just this config here. I'm just going to pass some of the CSS here. A lot of the anti-patterns are actually a workaround around problems we have every day. And people are, okay, I have to solve my problem and I'm just going to do this workaround and that's fine. And the workaround stays there. And a lot of the problems with those workarounds is that some of your other colleagues, they're just going to, go to the workaround and they see it, see, oh, this work, this is not a workaround, this is a best practice and a workaround becomes an internal practice. Also, another thing is we learn along the way. We evolve as a developers, as a community, we learn and we start seeing a lot of anti-patterns where again, quick fixes and the past of risk resistance and they felt good, they solve problems and they make us ship faster but they, they come with a price. So for the rest of the presentation, for me, anti-pattern, I'm going to give you the name. I'm going to give you example. I'm going to explain what's the problem with these particular anti-patterns and I'm going to offer other alternatives. So the first uh, anti-pattern for today is override CSS of inner components. And that's a very easy thing to do. Like the anti-pattern is you have a very simple component which just accepts a class name and it renders an H1. And let's say you want to make this H1 red. 
you're going to pass a style that foo. And in this style that foo, you're going to say, okay, I know this component has H1. And this H1 is a uh, color red. And this is a problem. And this and the reason for this is that every time you are coupling the style from an, from a parent because this class name lives in the parent of this component in the place this component is used so every time you are changing this component you have to make sure you're not breaking anything else this and uh, this is something very commonly done where developers have some inconsistencies with the design. Like the designer says, yeah, I want this header to be red over here. And we say, okay, yeah, I know there is H1 in this component. I'm just going to override it. And the way people try to fix this is uh, say, okay, I know this is a problem and I won't do it. So I'm going to add, an, I'm going to use another anti-pattern for this. And this is, pass a class name to another component. But what I mean here is, what we are going to say here is, okay, I want you use the for to override the header. I'm just going to have a component class. I'm just going to say, I'm going to have a header class name. And in this header class name is the going to be the class name of the class. And here I'm going to say, okay, I'm just going to pass that just red, which is better, which is a better version of this. Uh, because uh, we, as when we are refactoring this component in isolation, we know that, okay, uh, I have to accept this class name. The problem here, though, is that class name can be anything. Class name can change everything. So we have to check where this place is used. And the other problem is, what if we remove the header from this component? What if we this header class name doesn't become relevant anymore? A better option here is to be more explicit and just say, okay, component, your color is red. Or make something more as a semantic as a property. So we know that we support the red view of this component. And in our... The other fix we can do and make it a bit more is use children. Like, like we say, okay, uh, I don't want to style this H1. I want this H1 to be very special. So what we can do is we can just pass this H1 in the parent component and have it style and don't care about it. And the, our component just renders it. This is another way where we can have our components present stuff. This is, uh, uh, I think uh, some people name these slots, like you think uh, as your component as different slots and you can put everything in these slots and you style those slots separately. Uh, another anti-pattern which emerged was the, the overuse of the renderless components. Uh, what I mean by renderless components? Like in our application, we had those very useful components which were named window resize and window scroll. And window resize triggers a function when the window resizes. Window scroll triggers a function when the window scrolls. And those were great components until hooks appeared into the scene. Uh, a lot of the renderless components can be just expressed as hooks and, act and make the code smaller, make your React structure simpler, and overall, they are, they are a lot better. There are a lot of the renderless components should most probably be hooks. And that's a very simple change. And this is a very good example of things that were not possible and become possible later on. Another pattern which we used to have a lot was, and I think this is one of the reasons a lot of people don't like the class components is class components with render methods. What I mean here, uh, this is a component where which renders items and a lot of people say, okay, I want to have small functions and those small functions should be very expressive. So I'll just have a render function which would have a function called render items which in itself is going to map to all the items and they're going to render all items. 
And this is not that, that bad, but there is, but for me, in order to, for me to understand this component, I have to follow the breadcrumbs. A lot better version of this would be to have two components. One is the component which renders the list, which only says, okay, I'm just rendering my list and a separate component for the items. And in this way, this item component later can be used somewhere else. And in this way, or for example, if item is very expensive component, we can memorize it later. And this is the new preferred way to do so. And again, this was this is something which is a pattern which emerged because we have the class components and now we are not using the class components anymore as much. Uh, another anti-pattern, and this is an anti-pattern uh, which is not affected by React changing, but it's more of us developers wanting to be a, a lot smarter. So a lot of the times I see things like this. So I see a const of links and the, these links are a structure of, okay, I have a list of links and there is a two, where is this link to and what's the title of the link? And what I do here is I just look to all the links and render like a menu link component with all the data here. And there is nothing wrong with that, except at some point, some of these menu links might need another property. Some of this data might need to be dynamic. Like for example, we need the username or something from the user. And the problem with this map here is that it creates this indirection and it looks smart. It's like, okay, it's, I have this whole map, I can rechange it but it's very hard to understand the constant in isolation and the way to using it with links. The place this makes sense is if this links array is used in like 20 other places. And the solution to this, and in this case, it's actually the code is just even shorter. It's just inline it. Just have menu link to home, to about, to contact, just have it as a list and just read it as a normal React and make these React components cleaner. Uh, in this way, uh, you reduce the code, you remove, you reduce the cognitive load of the, the reader of the code who has to not only understand the constants, but then actually have to understand how it's used. Uh, another pattern which was very popular in the early days of React and it, it, it was the composing record to props. Uh, so what I have was used to seeing was we have a component and let's say we have a record which is called post. And what we do here is um, we decompose the post into this component because we were told, okay, we shouldn't just pass the, the, pop, the post because it's not very useful. The other version of this is we just post whatever we need from our component. So we say component, post ID, post title, post voice comment, and we just inline all of that. And that creates a lot of hassle. Like decomposing, the biggest issue with that was every time we add something new, our component receives from the props. The problem with this is it's really unusable. It's really hard to use a component where you pass like 20 props and you have to remember all the props. Every prop you have to the component is liability. So a better solution is to have the post and just pass it like that. And the reason this is now more feasible than, than before is first TypeScript. Because the reason people were passing components like this, post ID, post title, post boss count, were because initially we didn't have the type safety of t and we say okay i want to be more explicit about the state but nowadays when we write typescript uh what we have is we actually know that if the if the post doesn't have a certain property we uh our code errors out and we have this safety and this freedom and it's very clear what the post is Another thing which changed and make our life easier is GraphQL, where uh, we can have, for let's say, a backend in Rails, which have a GraphQL schema, and through Apollo, it generates a TypeScript types. So with something like Apollo code gen, what we can have is our component can say, okay, I'm a profile, I'm the profile avatar. 
and I need the ID, the name, the kind, and the image URL of the profile. And types and Apple Call Gen will generate a type for us, and we can use this type in our component. And then we can actually compose those types. Like we can compose the fragments for profile card. Like the profile card can also use the ID, the name, and it can also use the slug, and it also shows an avatar. And this goes all the up to the query. And with GraphQL, we can say, okay, the query is just a bunch of fragments, which is actually the, our component structure. And we can have the type safety of, okay, I just get a post and my component just tells me what data it needs. And if my component needs some other data, I just change the GraphQL fragment and it all goes up the chain without me changing anything else in my system which is one of my favorite features of GraphQL. Another, pro when we are on the type safety train, another thing which I have problem with, and we used to have more of that, and it's mostly used by people who are not very familiar with TypeScript, is the wildcard typing. What I mean by wildcard typing? Uh, if we have an interface for props and we can say, I accept the post. And this post can be anything. And I accept an old click header, and it can be anything. And I accept a caller, which is just a string. And then I destroy the whole type safety by saying, and I accept every key, which is a value. Which is like, okay, this basically makes my, my, my component to accept everything, which removes the, the type safety at all. A better version of this is to say, okay, I accept every HTML attribute. I accept a post, which is this particular post with all those particulars. I accept an on-click handler and it doesn't accept any argument in its avoid function. And my color can be only blue or red. This makes a lot easier to refactor your code to make to, to actually know you have a type safety. The previous version, you have zero type safety. And with this one, you actually know what we are doing. Another problem, which is a nice pattern, and I'm a bit hesitant to call it an anti-pattern because it's a very useful thing to be used in certain situations, like form helpers, for example. But it's a problem to be used very widely. It's a component as prop. Uh, at Product Hunt, we had a component for text, and the component for text can accept the component which uh, renders this text. Like we can render a text in a paragraph, we can render the text in a link, or we had a component called Flex, and when we wanted to give certain font properties to the, this component, we wrapped it in a Flex. And this caused a lot, a lot, a lot. A lot of issues uh, and make the code very spaghetti like and one one visible property of this was uh, you have to forward components from your core components to this component which wraps it up and it's very hard to make uh, type safe so this is base uh, this is a copy from pro hunt one of our components like that which we are refactoring out of. So it has its own components and then it has components that are passed down to its child component, like href, item margin, justify, on click, responsive, subject, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And the problem with this is that every, it's really hard to say, some of those properties are only for the link component. Some of those are really for the other component. And that's very problematic. And that's a pattern which causes a lot of issues. And the way to fix it is, okay, for the text component, I would only accept H1, H2, and paragraph. I won't accept wildcard every React component under the sun. Also, I would say, okay, I accept every HTML attribute if I care about that. Uh, another fix, which I haven't listed here, is uh, adding a bit more structure to the components which the, this component accepts. 
make it, you can do a lot of hacks with type safety here. Uh, this anti-pattern is one of the useful anti-patterns. Some features are really impossible to be done without this, uh, but it's also one of the problematic ones if over abused. Speaking to of properties, another anti-pattern I'm going to share here is uh, the un un unex unexpected defaults. And the problem here is we also had a component called flex. And the flex component was one of our most used components. And this component has two modes. And the modes were responsive and not responsive. Like what, what do we mean by responsive? So flex column, for example, would become a flex row when on a smaller device and the flex row in reverse will become a column and this is very useful to become or to make a, a, a useful front-end designs unfortunately we say okay this is very useful let's make the responsive through the default so what happened was that by default every flex column if every flex row on mobile were going to change to the opposite, like the column would become a row and the row would become a column. And this was not and this was counterintuitive. Most of the times we don't need stuff to be to change on mobile to be responsive. We only need this for certain components in certain places. Uh, and what we needed here and what was uh, happening was we started adding responsive faults everywhere. And most people just forget because you have to overwrite a default property. And what we did in the end was we removed the responsive property all alone and we just introduced a new component, which was called responsive column and responsive row. And this solves the problem because we become, made the implicit explicit. And every time you think around defaults, you should be very careful what you put into the defaults. The default should be false or inactive by default. Most of the default should be something is turned off. Uh, and you should be, you shouldn't be afraid to change the default. Like when you have a default and you see that this default doesn't work. If you have a proper TypeScript setup, it's very easy to change. It might break some stuff, but don't change it. Also, don't over add defaults early on. Add defaults later. Like you create a component and you're not sure which property should be the default. Don't make a default. Make every property explicit. Don't use a default in this case. And then see, okay, from 20 users of this component, only once I needed this property to be something else. Okay, that means I have an obvious default. Don't add defaults too early. Uh, another anti-pattern, and now I'm going to move into some patterns which are more performance-like. And this, this is using two components instead of one. So uh, what I mean by this, I I'm going to start from uh, a bit far. Often I see code like this. If, some, if there is some boolean check, if something is active, I'm going to render active. Then if, if something is inactive, I'm going to active inactive. And if you notice, this is just one single operation. You can just express this with a single, with a single is active, true, false, render one or the other. You don't need to add those two checks. And what, what I mean by using two components instead of one, in our application, we have this component called device. And the device have a version on phone and device have a version on tablet on desktop. And often I have seen code like this, which is like, okay, on the phone show this, on the tablet show that, and they're just right next to each other. And we had this version and people were not very used to using this where, okay, uh, we pass a function here and this function will tell us is it a phone or not and if it's a phone I render one version and if it's not it's the same and this is a single unit this is a single check uh, and often I see this pattern repeated where people uh, use multiple checks on the same line 
which can be expressed by basically a ternary operator. Another performance thing which bothered me quite a bit is uh, the need for closures uh, and use and the usage of unneeded closures in a system. Uh, so the unneeded closures in a system is where you have your component and you have your function and you create a closure that just calls the function. And most of the time that's not needed. You can just say click handle. And there is a lot of cases where we can just not use a separate closure. We can just pa pass the function. Uh, just one second. I just got a call from the backstage. Okay, I think my sharing might have broken. Let me re share my screen again. Okay, yeah, my sharing got broken for a bit. I'm just going to re-enable re it. Uh, yeah, it's working, so let's continue. So uh, another anti-pattern is the unneeded loops. Unneeded loops is where you do the functional chaining. Example of this is you have something which extracts edge nodes from a connection and then you map this collection. So you pay, so you do two loops, you create an one intermediate array just when you can just have a simple function which says, okay, just map the edge nodes once. You don't need to do this twice. Another the chip place I have seen this is, uh, let's say we have this case where we extract the edges from a connection node from GraphQL, we check if the connection length is empty and then we do the map. So here we also do two loops without needing. What we can do is we can check if the edges are empty in a function call and then do the map. Um, another thing which I have seen is uh, we map a whole thing just to get its first element. Just introduce a first function to get it. Uh, and yeah, this is uh, the final pattern I was going to share with you. Uh, and let me recap, uh, I'm almost done. Uh, I have a long, 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 long list of, um, of uh, anti-patterns. Uh, they are not all the anti-patterns I have seen in React code bases. This is the most, the one which I noticed the most. Here, um, a lot of those patterns are stuff that used to be cool, now it's not. And a lot of those are just workarounds and things that spur in the moment. Uh, a lot of things uh, we, we as developers are very prone to just add more options, uh, add a new prop, add a new variable, add this thing, add that here. And we are not like, okay, let's remove properties. Let's, compi let's compile stuff. And uh, this list is not very, it's, it looks long, but when you start working, a lot of those things are connected to each other. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, hope uh, that's all for my talk right now. Thanks. Uh, as I mentioned, all my slides are in, in, in speaker deck. You can go back to see the anti-patterns and let me see if uh, there are any questions uh, in the chat room. Okay. Questions. Q&A, I don't see any questions and I have only two more minutes. Okay. All right, so uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ping me on Twitter. I don't see any questions in the Q&A panel here. So yeah, uh, thank you for your time and have a great conference. Bye-bye.